Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the How Good Innovation Online series. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to the next hour of discussion. Um, as a way of introducing one another, if our audience members would like to put their name, where they're based, um, if you'd like, you could put your role or the company that you work for into the chat. Um, and that way we can maybe get to know each other a little bit more, even though we won't have time to formally introduce ourselves to one another. Um, my name is Leah Wolf. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I'm the head of regenerative education and content here at How Good, and I'm so excited to be speaking with some true innovators in the field of carbon and soil measurement, verification, and predicted outcomes today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking to these three innovators about how organizations can use eco and carbon labels as tools for transparency and build them into their action plans for reducing their carbon footprint and overall ecological impact. Um, joining us today, we have Al Toops, who's the head of sales for Biome Makers, Dr. Anastasia Volkova, who's the co-founder and CEO of Regrow Ag, and Diego Saez Gill, co-founder and CEO of Pachama. I hope you'll be able to join us for our upcoming sessions as well. Uh, first on November 18th, we'll be speaking with pioneers in carbon labeling, Sandra Noonan of Just Salad and Jen McKnight co-founder of Early Foods about the benefits and challenges of being early adopters of eco-labels. And on December 16th, Elizabeth Whitlow, Executive Director of the Regenerative Organic Alliance, and Mary Linnell Simmons, Director of Marketing and External Relations for Fair Trade America, will be sharing strategies for designing, contextualizing, and storytelling surrounding eco-labels to maximize impact. Just to run through a quick agenda for our time together today, we will finish up, finish up our introduction. We'll have a 30 to 35 minute conversation with our panelists. Then we'll have the opportunity for some community discussion for five to 10 minutes. And finally, we'll come back for a Q&A with the speakers before we wrap up right at the top of the hour. So with that, let's get started. Welcome to our three panelists today. Thank you so much for being here, Al, Anastasia, and Diego. I'm so excited to be speaking with the three of you today. Um, I'd love if each of you could do a quick introduction, just one to two minutes about yourself, about the organization that you work for, and something that you're excited about working on at the moment. And so maybe we go in alphabetical order. Al, Anastasia, Diego, does that sound good? Sure. Great. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you, Leah, for an invitation. My name is Al Toops, uh, soil scientist with uh, Biomakers and the head of sales. I've been in the ag industry my whole career, 30 plus years. <clears throat> and as you guys would probably uh, see by the, the title of what we do, we look at the microbiome in the soil. And the way we do that is uh, unique in the, in the form that we're able now to look at uh, the functionality of soil based on the biology by using a uh, 16S and ITS technology, looking at the DNA. Uh, conventionally, there's about 10 million soil samples pulled a year in the United States and North America, and those do one thing. They offer fertility recommendations, and now we have a method in-house where we can actually look at biological recommendations of pollen and the way the effects of these, organ these organisms are affected by inputs from farmers. So that's exciting to me to see this new technology emerging and how we can look at soil as a digestive system and not as a chemical experiment. And that's kind of cool. Anyway, I'm glad I'm here today and I'm, I'm uh, willing to listen and hear what others have to say about it. Thanks so much, Al. Anastasia, you're up next. Yeah, thank you so much, um, friends at How Good for having me. Uh, my name is Anastasia Volkova. I am the CEO and co-founder of Regrow uh, Agriculture and at Regrow, um, we offer a software that enables development of regenerative ag-based products uh, and projects in the supply chain. So if you're a food business, um, food company, if you're a trader, and if you want to leverage our gr your growers, your own growers, to create scope three insets to basically lower the emissions of your product, you would need a system uh, that would enable you to develop a program to take to your growers. Uh, so we develop those systems and software platforms. Um, one of them is, for example, the sustainability insights. It lets you explore the supply sheets based on the adoption levels of Regen Ag 
and on the impact that that adoption is having on the soil health. And the other one that we're a little bit more pop popularly known for is the MRV, the Measurement Reporting and Verification Tool that effectively leads to generation of carbon credits. Um, the a uh, cool thing about it is that you can give your farmers that tool and it will actually project how much you will improve the soil health and how much uh, carbon credit you're eligible for. Um, excited for the discussion today and thank you for having me. Thanks so much. Diego, you're up next. Thank you, Leah, and it's a pleasure to meet you all. I am Diego Saez Gil, co-founder and CEO of Pachama. Uh, Pachama is a technology startup focused on unlocking the full potential of nature, reforestation, forest conservation as a way to remove carbon from the atmosphere and compensate the emissions of our activities as we move towards a uh, net zero world. And what we're trying to do is bring the latest technologies, including satellite data and artificial intelligence that analyze satellite data at scale in order to increase the transparency and the accountability of uh, forest carbon programs, and to just make it more efficient for all the parties to connect from landowners and NGOs around the world who are doing reforestation and conservation to companies that want to invest in effective uh, and high quality forest carbon compensation projects. Uh, I am originally from Argentina. That's where I'm at right now, visiting my family in Tucumán, north of Argentina normally based in California. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for those introductions. Um, so I'd like to start out by talking a little bit. Uh, we're seeing both consumer demands and government regulations are sort of forcing CPGs, retailers, suppliers to start thinking about carbon labeling specifically, but also eco labeling and digging a little bit deeper into the way that their products ultimately have either a carbon footprint or an ecological impact. Um, and so I'd like to start out by talking a little bit about whether you all think that carbon demonstrates enough of a nuanced view of a product's impact. And if not, what else would we like to see going forward? I'll jump in then. Uh, if Great. No one's talking. Uh, I am. Um, yeah, getting quite excited about um, the ways that we can communicate the impact to the broader um, community, to shoppers. Uh, I think this is really something that will help get more money to the farmers, really. It will get more money to the projects that Diego is talking about. It'll um, really facilitate better investment, more conscious investment. Um, I really also love the way that you phrase the question, because is it a nuanced enough way to really tell how good is that impact or 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 not um i from my personal perspective think that this is a starting point and i don't think we can actually encompass all of the externalities uh, until we fully uh, understand how to calculate them and as an mrv provider we are obsessed with that like we really want to understand how to quantify everything that um, happens in the system um, what water quality benefits or disbenefits does this practice bring? Um, is this practice being implemented at the cost of um, some habitat that was was removed? Um, really, it's a um, labeling that you are starting with, which is good enough, I think, uh, for a certain point, because you're looking at the uh, carbon equivalence. So you, we shouldn't really think about just carbon and that's it. Like, like it's carbon tons, ton equivalents, because we may be calculating that this practice that someone's doing now with a conventional tillage, no cover crops, conventional synthetic fertilizer application, it actually probably has more nitrous oxide emissions than it has de facto carbon emissions, but we would calculate uh, the entirety of greenhouse gas emissions as the carbon ton equivalents. So from that perspective, I think it's a good starting point. It really tells you about agriculture needs to be greener and we learn how to quantify it. But at some point, I hope that 10 years from now, we will have the full regenerative production labeling, which will be quite nuanced in the same way that organic is right now, but we're not there yet. And it's difficult to incentivize in the way that we're incentivizing the carbon sink right now. 
I agree with that. I think what we have now is is a, a method in house to where you know when a farmer's looking at farming is 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 uh, his field does he really have any kind of uh, motivation to actually think about rejuvenative practices? And the carbon the carbon story is going to be something that's going to drive that. And if we can find a way that can show the farmer that he now has another value chain, another area of operational uh, inputs, then we got something that really adds equity to the farm. And that's that's something that we've never really studied in, in, in agriculture. Is the actual equity is the soil health. And if you can show that you can get a higher value uh, based on your production, if you're practicing rejuvenation, sustainability, those types of inputs become very valuable. And uh, you know that's that's where we're going now. I think uh, the organic the organic movement was was a great beginning, but it basically kind of told the farmer what he couldn't do in order to have a better product. If you kind of look at the rejuvenation area. And how we can actually improve it by looking at soil health, and you can reward the farmer by the, by the <clears throat> company buying the produce, paying a higher value, more money for better value crop. We call that uh, you know uh, so we have that in our in our in biomakers. We have a sustainability index that we're offering now to show give the grade, not a soil health score as much as we can actually show by the microbiology how you're better improving your soil conditions by adding better. Uh, Inputs, cover cropping, no-till, strip tilling, uh, you know, whatever it takes to build your biology back. And that's phenomenal when you're looking at uh, the opportunities that are we're facing now with the high prices of synthetic fertilizers and how to get better efficient use of what you currently have in the soil by adding uh, biological inputs. Yeah, and, and I'll ask this question to you, but I, it's also open to the other panelists as well. Um, when you're trying to find those projects or landowners or producers who are good candidates for, you know, making that transition or who might be good candidates for getting into the carbon market, how do you go about finding those producers and sort of convincing them that the carbon market and changing their practices is uh, the right way to go? Farmers want to make money. That's the bottom line is how can we monetize this and give them inputs that are actually going to show them uh, improvement. So what our technology does is we show these nutritional pathways. <clears throat> we, can look at a, we can look at a soil sample and tell you whether or not you're getting efficient use of your fertilizers. <clears throat> if we can improve those pathways by biological, understand, by better understanding the biology, then you can actually improve your efficiencies. And when you improve efficiencies, you improve yields, you improve value. And so that's, that's where we're going at it. So we see conventional farmers by taking a, an analysis, a physical, technical, scientific analysis of the soil biology and use also attached with that a conventional fertilizer recommendation analysis. Then we have something there that can say, hey, what I see from a conventional standard and what I see from a biological perspective are two different stories. How can I better improve my efficiencies with my fertilizers by adding biological inputs? Then you can re really, really improve it. We have guys that are improving, and you're seeing this all the day, you're, every day in the, in the, in the media where, where biological products are improving yields and improving quality. And uh, we're getting back to that stage where if the farmer knows that he can practice these uh, biological approaches and get better, quality and higher yields, that's a major driver. And so that's that's the angle we go at. So we, we have conventional farmers now that are jumping on board and looking at biologicals and, and, and those methods, because now we can prove it that with a scientific report that this can be achievable. Thanks so much. Um, Diego, I wonder, you're, you're on more of the reforestation side of things and less on the agricultural, although my understanding is that you are still, of course, thinking about agriculture and cover cropping, um, especially because agriculture is such a large driver of deforestation. I'm sure that that is uh, a part of a lot of the conversations that you're having. But I wonder if you have anything to add about the way that you're working with your producers, your landowners, and your projects. Um, and the kinds of conversations that you're having with them. Yes, absolutely. Um, we do work with uh, projects that are conserving forests, that are improving the management of forests, are replanting trees, 
And uh, we are very interested in getting into agroforestry because as you said, everything is interconnected. And what I would say is what we're hearing from them is, uh, as Al said, yes, they want to improve their economics, their incomes. Uh, they also want to get credibility on their efforts, right? And that's what we're also trying to provide with the satellite imagery. Um, and they want access to the other side of the marketplace, right? So uh, some of these projects are in South America, in Africa, in Asia, and you know the, the buying market is in Europe or the United States. And you know I think we're moving towards a world in which access is more democratized. And I think I'd, another thing I would say is that historically to participate in carbon markets, you had to be a very large landowner, thousands of hectares, right? Because only that way it made economic sense to go through all the hurdles of obtaining the carbon credit certificates. But with the technologies that we and others are developing, uh, that is going to change because we're going to be able to, to aggregate small instances of landowners into umbrella projects and use uh, remote sensing and other technologies to reduce the cost of measuring and monitoring the impact of the activities that these projects will do. Um, so that's what we're seeing on, on our partnership with landowners. Yeah, you, you mentioned the way that carbon markets and access to carbon markets has shifted. Um, measuring carbon sequestration has historically maybe been perceived as a bit unreliable. Um, was that based in truth? If so, how has the technology or the methodology evolved? And, and what kind of a difference has that made? And do, how do you see that uh, making a difference going forward? Yeah, I would say that there is always going to be errors on any estimations that we make. Uh, historically, the way that we've been doing carbon measurements of uh, land and forest is by sending people to the ground, taking sample plots, measuring every single tree uh, above ground and below ground, and, and then doing an estimation of how much carbon is there on that particular plot and then extrapolating that to the rest of the land, right? Now with satellite data, we can actually look at every single pixel of the land and we can train algorithms that basically correlate the measurements of the plots with characteristics on the satellite images or other sources of data such as LIDAR in which you get the, the shape and the height of the forest. And then those algorithms learn basically to correlate that the level of greenness and height of tree contains a certain amount of carbon. And with enough data, they become incredibly precise. As uh, you, know, you can see on any other applications of artificial intelligence, when Facebook or Google or Apple uh, you know, guess our face and we're like, how come they guess our face? Well, with enough data, algorithms get incredibly good at doing predictions on computer vision. So I think that that is going to improve the reliability of the assessments that we make of the forest. It's already doing it. We still need to, to give access to Zeta to, to more and more projects. I agree with that. I like the above ground approach, but me being a soil scientist, we look at the below the ground approach, where when you're looking at the, the microbiome, that there are associated biomarkers with carbon. We know that there are organisms specifically aligned with the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, phosphate, all, all the elements that go into the plant all have a biomarker. So we can now measure the amount of soil biomarkers associated with carbon to give you an accurate data below ground. So I think comparatively with what Diego was saying above ground, we'd have a really solid science to show the actual carbon number. Lee, yeah, I, I have to jump on on this one, right? If you're asking about carbon measurements, it's, uh, yeah, it's so tempting. <laughs> Um, especially for an MRV human. <laughs> um, what Alan Diego said is, is absolutely true, and we kind of do both. <laughs> so we don't just do remote sensing or soil microbes, we kind of do both. We have remote sensing feeding into the biogeochemical model of crop and soil to tell us how the microbes would actually respond. And um, compared to training a model as a one-to-one -one correspondence with a really big ton of data, there is not a ton of data out there on soil carbon worldwide, um, not in Eastern Europe, not in Africa, not in, not in a bunch of places that really need it. Um, so the approach that you have to take when you're 
someone like Regrow who says we're going to calibrate the model. That model will be applicable for a set of environments across a geography and a set of crop types and interventions across that geography. We actually take the model. Um, we have a large data set that we've um, meticulously put together of all the academic studies we could have possibly find that say if you change nitrogen this way we've measured carbon over the course of five to ten years and this is what happens in this and this and this in this environment then we ran the calibration validation exercise to actually get that model to be as representative of the outcomes as possible and we've submitted all of that for standards to get verified to get certified actually so we will have a um we've a, We've achieved and we've received the initial approval, which is extremely exciting. So very soon we will have a calibrated model, uh, at least for the greater US growing conditions. And we're actively working on extrapolating that with partners in Canada, Brazil, Europe, Australia. So when you look at that process of measuring soil carbon with a model that you've calibrated to known numbers that has known accuracy and known uncertainty, you actually get rid of some of the noise that you get on year, year to year measurements of carbon. You have to have a bigger picture if you want to understand how carbon stocks behave. It's not an annual or year to year delta. It really is something that shows up in five to 10 years scenario. And that's why the modeling not only can be more accurate long term, it can actually bring the costs of sampling down but you got to know how to do it and it has a higher upfront cost you can say because you got to calibrate it. Thank you so much. And and what I'm gathering from all three of you is that um what's so exciting is that we we now have access to all of this data, right? And you know, what we hope is that leads to transparency. Um I think that on this call we have a lot of people who are who are in the CPG industry, who are potentially in retail or 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 are ingredient suppliers, and so for someone like that, how how can their organizations take this transparency, um, take this data, and most effectively translate it to action, and and potentially you know maybe within the sphere of carbon or eco labeling, or if you have other ideas, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I can answer. I can answer part of that. Coming out of the lab world, uh, when the carbon when the carbon agenda began, uh, everyone had a different way of measuring it. I mean, you could find as many different carbon programs as there are out there, a different method for measuring that carbon. There is no standard method from the lab perspective. So whatever the whatever the program was, uh, they depended on some of it depended on actual testing a different way. They had there is no standard method. What we need to really all agree on is that we need to come up with some kind of standard carbon measurement method that that is followed to in order to get the cart credits and i don't know how that's going to happen what kind of legislation will have to be in place or how we'll all have to work together i know some labs in particular are beginning really to focus on that agenda and we think with our technology since we're looking at actually 16s and its dna uh, Looking at the extraction of biology with that, we have a method that's pretty standardized that, is, that could be part of that method. But, um, I'd like to hear others input on that because we definitely need to kind of figure out what we can do to, to, to gather up together to figure out what kind of solid method we can figure out to go and, and attack this. I, I have an answer at a different angle. So I understood your question as, well, what the supply chain partners can really do with all this data to convert it into something that is tangible for the shoppers or for consumers, for all of us. All of us go to, I don't know, Whole Foods, Walmart, whatever it is, and we pick up the box and we want to make a conscious choice and we want a choice to be informed. And so the good news is that you actually can do the mass balance approach as long as you know where you're sourcing, but you can also do a more specific here are my farmers approach. So you can actually quantify based on this amount of yield that let's say an ingredient company is, uh, has gathered or the, the trader uh, received from, from that farmer, looking at their adoption practices, looking at their emissions. Um, basically what we do is we calculate the, uh, the carbon intensity index. Um, so the CI, and you can use that CI to basically say, well, we really want to prioritize sourcing ingredients that have lower CI. And um, what you could also do is um, look at 
either implementing the sustainability goals or regenerative ag goals, um, and then working with your um, suppliers, with your farmers going all the way back in the, in the supply chain uh, to implement the interventions that you can then claim into, for example, scope three reduction goals. I'm not talking about, you know, shipping them somewhere and selling them to a tech company. I'm actually saying, well, if you put a goal that is looking at reducing your emissions around a certain product and looking through all ingredients in it, or just generally across your company, that, that would be the, the methodology, of course, quantifying the baseline, creating the intervention, and then monetizing that um, good effort and, 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 and investment that is being made, monetizing not so much, so much through driving the prices up of more premium products, but really through branding and the amount of product that the company would, would sell. So that's how I would um, summarize how our customers are being successful. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to point out to a few uh, new organizations that I've seen doing good work. Uh, there's an organization called uh, Climate Neutral that is focused on trying to you know, determine well what is uh, the climate impact of products and then to help compensate that with effective high quality uh, carbon projects. Uh, there's another called Carbon Fact that is also developing new updated simple formulas for a, a bunch of different categories of products uh, that also is trying to bring transparency uh, on products. And then Amazon with their Climate Pledge uh, initiative is also coming up with a label for, Amazon, for the Amazon marketplace that is also going to have a big impact. And I think that we're just at the beginning of uh, you know, a, a desire from consumers to know the climate impact of their products and then to know what our company is doing to reduce and compensate the climate impact. And that's going to take a lot of different shapes and forms. Uh, I would look into these three uh, to see where things are going. And, and our hope is that when it comes to the compensation part, consumers will want transparency of the, where the money is going, what is the actual climate impact and effect of these of this, of this projects. It used to be that you could easily say this is a carbon neutral product, it's not going to be so much the case. People are going to want to be able to click through and see, okay, what is actually behind the claims. And, and actually, we're seeing in real time right now as the COP uh, develops in, in Glasgow, uh, there's a lot of push for carbon markets and net zero, but also there's a lot of pushback from Greta, Greenpeace, and the environmentalist movement to make sure that this is not greenwashing, right? So uh, these are some of the things that I'm, I'm looking on the space. Yeah, absolutely. And and as you mentioned, those those organizations, uh, more people are entering the space, more organizations are entering the space because there are more carbon regulations going into effect. There's more consumer demand for carbon transparency, but not just empty transparency, something that can be backed up. Um, and I, I mean, I would assume that because of all of this, the carbon markets are about to grow very rapidly. And I'd love to hear a little bit about how your organizations are looking to adapt to um, to that growth um, and sort of explosive need? Good question. And I uh, wish there was a fix to just scale the company overnight. I really hope so. <laughs> Someone just invents it. Um, but it's, it's, the, it's the growing pain. Um, at the same time, it's very exciting because before we had a problem of convincing people they had a problem. Now everyone suddenly realized they had a problem and they're looking for a solution. We need to guide them and there should be more more companies like those that are gathered on this call, guiding others and, and helping navigate the conversation. In terms of our practical steps of how we're looking at, at scaling, we solve a lot of things through technology when it comes to scale. So looking at, at science and technology, making it scalable, making things automated, making things automated, even if we didn't think that that was a necessarily a process that needed to repeat more than a couple times like everything just has to has to scale on one hand on the other hand we're trying to parallelize it as much as possible so our food company customers they of course have sourcing regions um, that are um, spread around the globe and they would like to have access to to the measurements and uh, spin up projects in different um, areas. So we're, we're basically pushing for certification and model calibration in all the different markets at the same time. Having said that, I should say that we're really playing into the space of 
um, higher rigor um, carbon uh, or carbon credits, you can say. So we're really aiming for something that has a lot of validity, something that can stand up to a higher um, rigor standard, um, even if it is scope one, for example, um, because we have a feeling <laughs> from all the conversations we're having with standards that scope three really will be the new scope one before we know it. And so, um, yeah, that's how we're looking at it. We're also looking at it very strongly. Uh, we we understand that uh, <clears throat> there has never been a standard soil health test, and uh, we want to think that we have something there that can really contribute to that, so that the farmer has some kind of a, an index that can give him a score, say you're doing these practices that can improve your, your uh, soil biology to the point to where you actually get, like I said earlier, you know, a, a better re return on your on your product that you're producing. But we know that for the lab marketplace, because what we have is a method that, that's in place. If you think about it, what we've been doing with fertility management over the last 75 to 80 years has been when you do a soil analysis, you're getting a fertility recommendation. We're selling fertilizers with these technologies. And now the farmers need to really look at the fact that this is actually, when you think of the, the, the progression of farming over the last 150 years, you know, Thomas Jefferson invented the the moldboard plow, which came out in the 1850s. And we went from looking at the 1950s, looking at, uh, you know, chemical, the, 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 the chemical inputs on farming and driven by the retailers to convince farmers that we can actually get, feed the world by more uh, chemical inputs. Now we realize that all along we've been looking at a biological system. And so the, the we're in we're in the stages in agriculture where we're actually I would call it a paradigm shift. Uh, carbon is kind of driving it, but we're actually moving along pretty quickly to the understanding that if we're going to sustain our food supply for the next 50 years, we have to really seriously look at what we're doing to our soil. And you know we're losing we would roughly. A, a 30 percent of the total inputs come in every year or. or, or designed for biological fixing. I mean, we have all these problems that we're not, you know, I'm, I'm looking at farmer, farmland now that 50 to 60% of their, of their product is lost due to disease. And uh, that's because the soil biology is so weak. And we've got to get back to the stage where we can actually build this back. And I like the carbon approach because that gets everyone's attention. The consumer likes it. We know that everything in, is related to that. And but ultimately, we want to be able to fix our problem biologically, and the farmers need to have an incentive to do it. And I think that we are on the right path here, and I think that we're going to figure it out. There's just a lot of, you know, it's kind of like the Wild West, where we're we're still fumbling around trying to figure out the best approach. But we'll get there. And our group, our group at Biomakers, is committed to this carbon this carbon objective, and uh, I think we're going to see some very astounding answers here pretty quick. Thank you so much, Diego. Do you do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, uh, to your question of scale, how do, how do we prepare to scale in front of the growth that is coming? I am a big believer of technology as a lever uh, for scale. Right, software allows us to um, do what humans, uh, you know, cannot do on their own. Right, so and, and that's why I'm so excited about artificial intelligence at the service of these uh, businesses. There's so much we can automate, so much that we can uh you know give access with you know the internet with the fact that everybody has a smartphone I, I was in the amazon rainforest two years ago and people in the middle of the forest with smartphones right so i think that technology will play a big role on how can we scale um all the things and and i think that it will take a lot of coordination and cooperation but i think that that's how we scale totally agree <laughs> And how do you think, so I, uh, I think one of the, the biggest critiques of carbon labeling or eco labeling, but specifically to carbon, is that in the same way that nutritional labeling sometimes lacks context for the consumer, that carbon labeling and seeing the carbon equivalent of what a product um, emitted um, is not powerful enough of a, of a raw data point without context for the consumer. Um, and so I wonder if, any of you have done any strategizing or thinking about the best way to, for these companies to put 
that carbon or that ecological impact into perspective for the consumer? Yes, we are. We're looking at nutrient rich foods. I mean, that's the whole goal. Once you build up your once you build up your soil biology and you get your carbon data, your carbon levels up higher, then I think there's going to be a day soon where the consumer will see that he can actually see the value of that nutrient in that in that product. And that that'll come down from the uh, food producer, but he can he can demand that the grower produce better, higher quality, nutrient rich uh, product. So that is measurable, and that's going to pay the farmer more money to incentivize them to actually put rejuvenative practices in place on their farm. Yeah, I'll say that uh, we're looking into ways in which biodiversity indexes can be measured from satellite data. Uh, and I think that definitely uh, we, we don't have to be maximalist of carbon on this type of projects. Otherwise, we can end up in a world full of eucalyptus trees and no biodiversity, right? So I think that uh, it is important that, that we do measure the things when we approve and certify projects. Uh, now, it's true that for consumers, you know, you cannot put 20 metrics. You have to put one metric and they have to trust that behind the scenes, people are checking for all the different aspects of, uh, of a project. Uh, and, and yes, when it comes to forest, there is biodiversity, there is water, there is social uh, impacts, right? That all, all of that needs to be accounted, uh, measured and monitored. I would say that um, it can be really fun for a consumer to order a burrito and really see Bill Nye tell them how much carbon it has. I, I think it's awesome. I think it just draws the, um, the consumer awareness and education to the point that is quite important um, in, in our day and age. So I, I think it, it does it. And the brand of the company that can really pull that off, uh, pull that off credibly, is certainly communicating that this is a big enough problem for them and they will be um, moving forward on this mission of getting even better at measuring and, and reducing their impact. Um, and it certainly is not the full story, but people don't know that this problem exists still. Like they're not quite sure uh, what's happening. Like we've been, um, you know, in a world where, okay, let's get off the animal protein, let's get on the plant protein. And okay, well, that penetrated the public's um, attention and field of view somewhat, but that's not necessarily uh, where the whole problem in agriculture emissions is contained. So I think the, the more widespread um, the, the things are that really can communicate the real world numbers in the way that is contextualized for the consumer to know um, and know the, the background of how their decisions really are impacting the supply chains. I mean, everyone appreciated during COVID when supply chains were disrupted that certain foods were wasted and that was in national news or certain foods were not available and when you uh, have a choice of shopping locally versus shopping globally what does it mean why does it matter that they sh they're shipping it with you know not on land but by sea um, all of these things will ultimately drive very deep economic transformations um, and i'm a believer that you got to start where you are right now to really win uh, at the game of by 2030, we need to do X. <laughs> well, we need to do as much as possible in the right way. And for that, we need a lot of education to, to happen. And it's a brilliant tool uh, to draw attention to the right problem. From there, you can expand and you can definitely contextualize things more. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Clint. We have a question from the chat. Um, and the question is about cost. So if you get $100 for a carbon credit, what does the value chain look like in both agroforestry and Red Plus pro projects? Um, we're competing directly with palm oil, so the returns have to be as good or better for it to be truly sustainable. So I think it might also be helpful context if if we could just um, get an estimate of what, what, what is a producer getting for a carbon credit? Is it product specific? And um, yeah, if, if any of you would like to speak directly to Clint's question, um, I'd Sure, we appreciate appreciate it. Sure, sure. I mean, the the soil carbon credits, they're all in carbon tons and they're metric carbon tons. So they're not necessarily, the, the amount that you can get based on what you do with the farm is different, but it's practice specific. So there are different things you can do to 
a palm oil plantation to a vineyard in Napa and to a cotton field in Georgia versus cotton field in, in California. So you can really do different things, but they're different just because the, the soil, the precipitation and the practices are different. Fundamentally, what you're measuring, so you have the same measuring stick. So you're trying to get everything to a CO2 E, so a ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, and that's what you get paid for. I would throw some numbers and say, um, currently in Europe, and people talk about 35 euros a ton. In the US, it's more around $20 a ton. Um, and that is reflective of the maturity of the market, given that some of the European countries like France and the UK, they're really mature in the whole labeling uh, side of the house and in, in consumer awareness and willingness to pay. So we believe that it will go up. And Dr. Ratan Lal, the um, a Nobel Prize winner for a piece and, um, and, and, and um, food and ag. He's saying that really the true cost that needs to be paid is on the order of 110 to 130 dollars a ton uh, in, in farming as well. And we're really hopeful that with the good quality data, transparent processes, certification, you can get it up there and people will stop talking about, well, it's not really permanent. Nothing is really permanent if you really go you know, deep enough. Um, so that's, that's what the cost metrics and variables are there in, in, in our world. Thanks so much. I can comment that uh, since we started our company three years ago and today, uh, the price per ton of carbon across all the different projects that we look at have more than tripled. Uh, so the direction, uh, we're moving in the right direction, right? And I think this is driven by uh, increased demand uh, and it's driven by, by more financial players coming and, and, and bringing liquidity to the market. And, and we will continue to see an increase in price. Today, uh, a Red Plus project is selling credits for you know, at least uh, $8 per ton. And again, that is a huge increase from what it was before. Uh, reforestation agroforestry projects for $25 per ton. And, and, and rising. And, and what I can tell you is that uh, those numbers are starting to get interesting in South America, where I'm you know, quite familiar with the market, uh, where you know, a landowner can get maximum $50 uh, per hectare per year by doing soybean planting. Uh, you know, these numbers of uh, per ton actually starting to make carbon farming being a, a very interesting alternative. Thank you so much. And thanks for the question, Clint. Um, and if anyone else has questions, please feel free to put them into the chat and we'll make sure to try to get to them. Um, I wonder if you guys could talk a little bit about uh, maybe what, how, how these carbon labeling and eco labeling demands have maybe changed the way that your organizations are doing things, the way that you're working with labeling schemes already, if so, and maybe how you see that uh, going in the future. Unbelievable silence, look at us. Um, <laughs> all right, so um, in terms of the labeling schemes, I would say that they're quite fresh and the fact that some CPGs are saying, okay, we're gonna do uh, carbon labeling. Okay, fantastic. Um, I mean, I'll be transparent. We do work with other folks that work in LCA world. Can be how good, can be Qantas, can be a bunch of folks who can give us the data that we don't have because we are focused on biogenic. Like here is what happened to the soil. Here's what happened on the farm. Everything that happened after it left the farm, we really, are not experts in that. And they're people who are experts in that. So if you tie that together, you can then say, here's a true impact. But before that was done in a way that is all data set based. So the labels weren't necessarily indicative of the real world scenario, because if everyone's working off of the same standard data set, oh, I have tomatoes in California. Well, here's an emission factor for them. Well, tomatoes in California, can be very many different things and have very different impact and carbon intensity index. So now when we are at this explicit new world of like, you can actually quantify what happened in this field and how much of that went to the product and how much of that 
went into emissions, um, you can now start talking about moving, like we're moving the standards more so, but moving the world of standards to the point where it can become a, a label. So right now, it's uh, really tied to a quantification exercise on the product level. Here are the ingredients. Here is their um, supplier-specific emission factors. Here's the fraction of that that went into the product. Um, so it's a lot better than a mass balance approach of like, we are sourcing roughly here. How much is that? To like, okay, these are our soybeans. <laughs> okay, good to see them. Now let's look at the fields and let's calculate it. And now we can actually know your numbers. So I think... It just happened so recently that the labeling wasn't able to caught up to get, to get caught up because the standards are still catching up. Um, that's that's where we see the markets at. Totally agree. Amazing. I agree with that totally. Thank you so much. So I'd like to e ask each of you if you had a billion dollars to invest in something related to eco carbon labeling or something within your own sphere that you're just really excited about. What would it be? For me, I'll tell you what it would be. We, when, when you look at from, I'm a lab guy, so I'm looking at soil testing from, from that perspective. Uh, we need to standardize this. We need to have methods that are standardized so we can actually do something that's consistent across the board where everybody that's involved in this marketplace can have a standardized measurement so they can have some tool. So if I had a billion dollars, I'd probably work diligently with the, with the soil testing world to figure out what I could do to standardize our methods for testing and measuring carbon and, and other and other biological inputs uh, factors. Thank you. Diego, I was going to give you the opportunity to go next. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I guess if I had a billion dollars, uh, I'll definitely invest it on forest conservation and restoration. But when it comes to uh, labeling, I think I probably I would do a, a really massive campaign around the world to raise awareness about what matters and, and to raise, at the end of the day, you know, it's so easy to point fingers to corporations and politicians, but consumers drive what and how do we do things in the planet. So I think I'd, I'd probably do a, a massive campaign to raise awareness and then to you know bring clarity about how and what should we be looking at uh, in, in the face of uh, consumption uh, on a climate changing world yeah and um, i'm more an else camp here i would give all the money to just do a bunch of soil carbon testing and to not just randomly but to establish and that's what we're preaching to each government that asks us for advice uh, is to establish the sentinel sites where there'll be consistent measurement of soil carbon over the long term where the regenerative practices will take place, where different experiments will take place so we can really see uh, and calibrate the model because the way that we can make things more scalable and better is by have the relevant data. Um, so that's that's where we're at. And um, if you, um, let me, I want to pick up Rohali's uh, question in the chat. I just think it's really relevant. Sure. Yeah, um, great. Thank you. Um, so the question is uh, about the reliable databases uh, with accurate carbon intensities. Um, I actually think we're going to go away from the databases. So um, instead of having a database that says, well, here are the standard intensities you should use, uh, we are working now with um, a lot of food companies on actually quantifying theirs. So. If you have a particular supply chain you're working with, um, you really want to know the intensity that is that pertains to that product in the supply chain. So if someone kind of goes and quantifies average numbers, um, even we have the data to, to do it, uh, but it is all conditional because really to say we're changing the world for better, you need to invest to make the change to then reap the benefit of it as a, as a food company. So the starting point is, okay, better carbon intensities, but really the next stage is exploring all the different supply sheds by carbon intensity, which is the type of data that we do have. And that's why we're partnering with LCA companies. But really the next next stage, stage three, is to take your own suppliers, your own supply sheds that you know you're sourcing from and, and quantify it because the world will only demand more explicit quantification. We will really go away from the databases very soon because they're not going to 
to pass the, the filter. And that's why I would give my billion dollars to explicit data collection tools to, to get us all to a better place with data. Yes, and I would be remiss, of course, if I did not mention that uh, how good has the world's largest ingredient sustainability database linked directly to raw materials and ingredients that you can use to then measure each ingredient's greenhouse gas emissions, which may not be as in-depth of a carbon intensity measurement as you're talking about, but is an excellent tool and also offers other metrics, um, including labor and biodiversity, which is something that we're talking about a lot today. Um, I would love to invite anyone else in our last five minutes to either put a question in the chat, or if you're feeling brave, you can take yourself off mute and ask the panelists directly. So I'd like to give everyone a, a chance to do that. Um, otherwise, um, I would love if, if Al, Anastasia, and Diego, if you have any closing um, thoughts, statements regarding the future of eco-labeling and carbon transparency, I would love to, to hear that from you at this time. I'll jump in real quick and, and do a closing comment. In my career, the last 30 plus years in agriculture and being a soil scientist, it's exciting for me to see our culture as a whole beginning to really look at our earth environment and our, uh, and our ecosystem and, and then see the impacts and be measured, measurably uh, active to change what we've been doing in practices in agriculture. That's exciting to see. It's, it's fun to be a part of that. And uh, it's a good to be a part of a group like Biomakers. Our total focus is toward helping farmers and helping our environment and helping our climate totally uh, with our technology. Thank you so much. Um, let me, I would like to address just, we got two last minute uh, questions in the chat, so I want to make sure we address those before we close out. Um, Joe, I would like to know if it's possible to combine nutrition and sustainability into one single metric. And I know that we're seeing both the eco and the nutri scores that are coming out of France and, and Europe at this time, um, which are, you know, being measured separately. Uh, do you guys see in the future um, um, some sort of metric that could measure both? So it's a brilliant question, but it's like, you're trying to mix the ecosystem health and the human health into one, which is very meta. And I really want to get there. It's great. <laughs> it's like, we really want to be in that world. Realistically right now, what can be, what is healthy for the soil is, is healthy for the human. And as I was saying, like, it's going to be a healthier, nutritious food for sure. But the way you measure it is going to be different. And so you really need to stick to some metrics you can kind of grasp and invest in and put as KPIs without yet integrating them together because we don't fully understand each of them apart. So yeah, maybe in 10 years. Amazing. Um, and then we have one. I like oh, go the ahead, idea yeah. that it does, you know, we do need new ideas and creative thinking to, uh, you know, better measure. You only improve what you measure. So to better measure, you know, the full ecological impact. Uh, and, and uh, you know, a word that I like a lot is regeneration, right? It's not enough to be sustainable. We have to be regenerative as a planet. So if there was a regenerative index, that would be super cool. Yeah. Yes, I would love to see that as well. Um, great. Well, I'm sorry we're not going to get a chance to get to the last question, but I just want to give Anastasia and Diego a chance to give a closing, closing statement, and um, yeah, and then we'll we'll wrap up right at the top of the hour. Yeah, we're really excited about making all the quantification in this space more explicit. To going from extra abstract databases, abstract um, systems and processes to here is what. I do, here's what my company does, here's what we source and here are the farmers we source it from and here's how much impact it has on the planet and this is how we can solve for it. Because if we're not gonna get down to that level, what's not measured is not managed, as, as we just said, as Diego just mentioned, but also if you don't have a specific target you're trying to work on, how can you really do it? How can you influence a number that you are currently not influencing and creating? So that's where I think we should be, we should be focused. Diego, you have the last word. Yeah, well, you know, I guess uh, support uh, startups and innovators doing trying to do this. It's not easy to try to bring new ideas into into this world. Um, we need all hands on deck. 
And, and yeah, let's remember that nature is our biggest ally um, and, and keep going, keep trans trying to transform your organizations. Everyone is a climate warrior that can have a big impact. Great, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you to our speakers for taking the time and sharing their experiences, strategies with us. I look forward to um, seeing you all again in the next uh, innovation series on November 18th. Thanks so much.